once you have invested yourself as being an oracle of judgment and then have to on the heels of that be the oracle of restoration uh, is like a contradiction how do you go from the one to the other and you see here we have to have a prophetic sense of things you have to intuit this and a corresponding text would be Ezekiel 37 where the prophet whose word of judgment has been fulfilled to bring Israel to the valley of dry bones that they are without hope we are cut off we are as dry bones is now the same prophet who's got to prophesy to the nation to raise it from the dead which is the death that has come by his own speaking you see what I mean? and um, maybe that's why he had to be brought out by the hand of the Lord and down by the Spirit into the valley of dry bones what God was saying to him is I'm going to require you now to contradict yourself you said one thing now I'm going to require you to say the other and you've got to say it with the same conviction and authority as you spoke the first even though now it's another message altogether so it's not only the, the nation that's brought into a place of death the prophet himself so more than any other the prophet cannot be allowed to be fixed in his own categories <coughs> however correct they are the Lord must be Lord even to the place where he seems to contradict himself it, it's something like Paul saying let God be true and every man a liar yeah. however much you can't fathom these contradictions God is God and you are the vehicle and the mouthpiece for that God and you need to come into an agreement with him even when it contradicts your own categories just like a, a Jonah so um, what kind of a man is that? and if we're saying that it's not only a prophetic man we're talking about but a prophetic church that the church of the last days is prophetic in its very constituency it must have this kind of yieldedness to the Lord and it's something like Moses turning aside to see the burning bush and what the rabbis say that what God so honored is that when he saw him turn aside then he called him by name out of the bush because once you turn aside there's no turning back and you know it's remarkable how much people have an investment in what they believe and what they understand and do not want to contradict it even by God because it's their security <coughs> what would be an historical example of this where a people had been called to contradict their own understanding <coughs> of their own expectation of things given them by God and could not bring themselves to do it and even slew him who was the one who had presented the view of God to their own detriment it's Israel with Jesus he was not in the form of their anticipation they had wandered from the scripture they were under the influence of rabbinical expectation uh, here's God coming with fresh revelation and so fresh that even the disciples did not understand it even even to his death when they saw him on the cross we thought it had been he who would have restored the glory to Israel but as he spoke with them on the way their hearts burned as he opened to them the scriptures of the things that pertain to himself out of uh, the prophets and, and the Psalms uh, Christology the study and the understanding of the significance of the atonement through Christ is a post-resurrection phenomenon the church itself did not understand it was bewildered but the unfolding came after his death and through, through the apostle Paul and so on that the church began to formulate its own understanding Jesus himself was God's hermeneutical key he was the principle of interpretation of the messianic prophecies by his own peculiar fulfillment of them contrary to Israel's own expectation and when Israel was faced with a choice of cleaving to their mosaic view and expectation as against the revelation that had now come in this man it was a historic and costly choice because their view was so dear to them and their identity was so <coughs> rooted in that view that they rejected the revelation and God himself who bore it so don't think that believers are not susceptible hardline fundamentalists 
baptistic people resisting the baptism of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. or pa uh, Pentecostal groups resisting the phenomenon of the prophetic mm -hmm. they have no place for it in their view or pre-tribulation rapturists resisting the view of the rapture that is post-tribulational you know we have an investment in a, and a security in our views and the ironic thing is that so far as we understand it the view has come from God it's as we, as we think God is saying so let God be God and every man a liar you know, the prophet of all men has got to be available to be, to be contradicted in his own categories or it's like uh, Abraham take thy son thine only son whom thou lovest and make of him a sacrifice in the mount that I will show you it contradicted everything that Abraham could conceivably have understood about God even to this day Jewish commentators are offended that God would be thought to be asking the life of a son because God does not perform human sacrifice and it prefigures the sacrifice to come but uh, what's more important our view or the God of our view and the last identification and union with God that makes us his instrument is this union where we're even willing to put aside what we know when God called Moses up to the mount before he could come into his presence on the seventh day remember in the forty days of neither eating nor drinking he was six days in the cloud of smoke which was not marshmallow it was not cotton candy it was a devastating smoke of the fire of his glory that completely obliterates every human orientation I always tell about the fire that we had down at the camp in the Judah house where we were sleeping that night and I had to go back into that burning house and get Inger's pocketbook on the counter of the kitchen which I said was no, no, no sweat you know, just a few feet in from the doorway sure thing I, w I went in on my hands and knees the house was filled with smoke and I got in through the door and I was absolutely totally lost not only could I not find the kitchen counter I couldn't find the door through which I had just entered it was a paralyzing fearful moment of a complete absence of orientation in the thick smoke imagine six days why six come on you scholars why six six is a number of man we got to be completely emptied even of the things that are correct and given once upon a time by God to come into actual union and presence with him where there we receive the tablets of the law after we have come unto him and been there so uh, any man who resists that is disqualified prophetically maybe another definition of what a false prophet is is one who will go so far that no further you, know, you can bring me this far but I'll never change that well like Peter saying Lord I've never eaten anything unclean and a vision had to come down of a of a uh, a, a veil or a screen with un take and eat but Lord I've never yeah. I don't care what you've never and even though you've never done it because of the law of Moses I'm telling you now that what I have called clean let no man call unclean take and eat God has got to be God and what a tragic price we have paid as a Jewish people for putting our opinions over the God who gave us our opinions so God forbid that the church should repeat that error if we will reject the revelation of God by his word we'll have to obtain it in, our, in the experience of it in suffering and I'm, I'm sure that many will gasp in that wilderness a time of extremity right? oh my God now I see now I understand what he bore that in, that in the experience of our rejection and our persecution we can now understand his to what degree are we identified with Israel mm -hmm. are we going to look at, you know, from a superior place of poor souls they're going through their suffering or I, uh, are we in their afflictions are we afflicted mm -hmm. and maybe in our identification which is actual and not just theoretical the willingness to bear their suffering and their reproach and death in their behalf as we harbor and take them in will be a demonstration for them again also something of the attributes of his character that will bless the nations by the way the unbelieving nations will see the crucifixion of Jesus played out in the history of his people so once again the final drama is enacted for the benefit of all 
through the, the cost of suffering, but at the end he wipes every tear away and uh, heals every hurt and uh, there's eternal rejoicing. <laughs> what does it say? The, um, the redeemed of the Lord shall return, mourning yeah. and sighing shall pass away, yeah. and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. What a painful final consummation and conclusion to the whole Heilsgeschichte, the whole redemption history, the saga of God, finally consummated in the <coughs> actual experience of the, of the nation that survives, the remnant, aided and abetted through the church, identified with it and bringing it through that by our mercy they might receive mercy at a time when if they don't receive mercy they will perish. And that surviving remnant would be redeemed and returned to Zion to receive the Lord who is their king and the king of the Jews <coughs> and for the Jews to go out over all nations and bring the, the beneficent uh, blessing uh, to all mankind. It's, a, it's an enormous drama. Okay. So we want to examine something of the judgment that leads to the um, tribulation of the last days <coughs> and that the understanding of judgment as we have said is through the prophetic recognition that it is relative to the sins of Israel. It's not God being arbitrary. It's not God taking a malicious delight in seeing his people suffer. Their, their, their punishment and their judgment is in exact proportion to their sins. The sins of their fathers and their own, and even Jeremiah saying that your sins are worse than your fathers. And the basic sin, and this introduces us now to an important aspect of the whole study, is the failure to keep covenant. The rejection of, of covenant failure. And I'm raising this question. Is covenant obligation still a requirement of God for this people? Even when they disannul or do not acknowledge the covenant or their obligation to keep it. Are they still under the requirements of the covenant even in their ignorance of it? And if so, and the, and the covenant condition for failure is judgment by expulsion, is in fact the very grounds by which we can expect a last day's expulsion again out of Israel and into the nations for the same reasons that former judgments of expulsion had taken place, namely the failure to keep covenant. Whether if the fact that men do not acknowledge it or recognize it does not invalidate it nor its terms. It's blessing for keeping and curse for failure. Mm -hmm. And the curse is to be expelled from the land. And I've never heard anyone articulate this. That this might be the very ground for which we can rightly expect another expulsion of Israel out of the land and into the nations of the failure to keep covenant. The truth of the matter is there's very little covenant consciousness in modern Jewry at all today, even in Israel. But remember when the covenant was made at Sinai? Yeah. And they transacted with God, and, they, and I think it was the Lord who said, not only do I transact this with you this day, but those who will subsequently issue from you for, uh, for all posterity, that you're standing now in an alignment with me for all generations. We Jews are obligated now for the covenant commitment made by our fathers 4,000 years ago. And that the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and who does not change, is not at all impressed with the passage of time. The truth of the covenant, and, the, and, the, and to which we have uh, covenanted and made oath, is still valid today. And uh, if I'm barking up the wrong tree, I, I, I welcome correction. And I write here that this view is lost to contemporary Jews and even to ourselves, locked as we are into individualistic modalities and mentalities. You know what I'm saying here? Covenant is with a nation. It's with a people. And we have become so individualistic in the civilization that we have been birthed that we have lost this consciousness <coughs> of covenant relationship between a people and a God. 
and therefore uh, it's out of our consciousness as well as out of theirs or we would have warned them long ago to obey and to keep the things to which their fathers uh, committed themselves and this opens up a whole spectrum of things national or corporate covenant and commitment as against individual responsibility before God there's a phrase that the theologians use called solidarity <coughs> in sin by which past and future generations are joined in collective accountability this is a concept totally lost to modern man but it's not a concept lost to God and as we said yesterday when men will be judged it's not by virtue of their view but God's view and part of our prophetic task is to bring modern men into alignment with God this is God is the giver and the keeper of covenant covenant is an, a heavenly concept it came down to men from above and God is very serious about it he's a covenant keeping God he gave us a new covenant but everything is covenantal and it brings in the whole dimension of things corporate which is lost to us in our individualistically minded age and in that way only can we understand how God can judge an entire nation and even a present generation of that nation even for the sins of their forebears because there is a solidarity in sin there's an unbroken continuum of sin until a present generation acknowledges the sins of their fathers as their own and that the judgments which have been required have been just Leviticus 26 that acknowledgement has never historically come and I mentioned yesterday attending a lecture in Phoenix by a rabbi on the prophetic the prophets of Israel and he showed the indictment against Israel coming from God's own prophets and I raised the question when in our national history have we ever acknowledged that indictment to be true let alone requited it and, the, and it's, the question answers itself we have never we do not see ourselves as connected as having any obligation but this is the way that God sees and mere indifference to the question <coughs> silence about it makes us culpable in the guilt of it the only thing that breaks that connection is repentant acknowledgement of the sin which has not come therefore present Israel is subject to any moment's retribution and judgment which still hangs over their heads seeing that there's been no national repentance or acknowledgement or a review of and a return to covenant with any thought to keep it that the new covenant is not some innovation but exactly the fulfillment of the covenant that has always been before Israel but now with the acknowledgement that Israel itself cannot perform it it has taken all this time all these millennia to show the utter bankruptcy of the nation not because they're Jews but because they're men because man cannot in himself perform the righteous requirements of God and so in the new covenant I will write my law in the inward parts and they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them and uh, obey my ordinances and my commandments I'll give them the very enablement that's what makes it new because look what your history has demonstrated not only a failure to keep it but an indifference even to, indifference even to acknowledge it and that's why this will be an everlasting covenant there ne need not be any one after that because it will never be broken it shall be perpetually kept in the power of God who gives it to a people completed in power humanly speaking that's the whole underlying uh, of this drama the last day. we Jews are so self-sufficient so confident in our own ability even to perform things religiously until there's got to be the most thorough emptying out until when, when our, the power of the people shall be broken then God comes in to be their savior their deliverer to bring them back out of bondage out of captivity to restore them to the land to rebuild the cities that have been laid waste and made desolate to set up his sanctuary his temple 
and I will be your God and you will be my people and in the power of my life being resurrected you'll be able to, to fulfill what was your call from the beginning a nation of priests and a light unto the world all these millennia to perform this to demonstrate to all mankind the attributes and character and blessing for all the nations of the earth that what God has done for Israel he'll do for any people because he's full of grace and mercy it's a very great drama I don't have a word for it I'm quoting now from a German theologian I told you that the Germans have the, the corner on theology God bless them about this principle of collective accountability that is absent from our modern consciousness and he writes in the theology of the Old Testament the prophets bring not only their own contemporaries before God's judgment and denounce them for their rebellion but also see them linked with all previous generations in a unitary entity by which the sins of the fathers are also the sins of those now alive and will be required of them maybe we ought to turn to Leviticus 26 this is Walter Eichrodt E-I-C-H-R-O-D-T in a classic study called The Theology of the Old Testament volume 2 page 407 and it's kind of a little bit of an irony that German theologians have a better grip of the mystery of God for Israel than Israel itself and had Israel heeded the German theologians in the knowledge about God that would have come from them they might have been saved what came from them what came to them from Germans who were not theologians but Nazis look at Leviticus 26 you remember what um, the famous uh, Holocaust writer uh, Ailey Wiesel said to me when I said to what degree are you willing to consider that the calamities of Israel even in the Holocaust and all of our historic suffering <coughs> has been the fulfillment of prophecies spoken by God in the concluding chapters of Leviticus and mm -hmm. and his answer I refuse to consider that let's take a look at what he's refusing to consider <coughs> and, um, these are the curses of the covenant in chapter 26 verse 17 I will set my face against you you shall be slain before your enemies uh, they that hate you shall reign over you you shall flee when none pursue you and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me then I will punish you seven times more for your sins and I will break the pride of your power that's exactly what Israel is in process of presently experiencing and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass you'll have no answer from above and no help from below verse 22 I will also send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highway shall be desolate I think that could be literal uh, when the cities are ruined wild beasts may prevail but it's also a picture of the wild beasts of Nazism and the wild beasts of neo-Nazism that are already gathering momentum and will again ventilate their hatred against Israel verse 24 I will also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins you know, to whom much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. Little wonder that so many of us as Jews have said, who wants to be chosen? Look, look at the consequence when we fail to fulfill that. And I will bring the sword upon you that shall, and shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. Isn't that an interesting phrase? The controversy that God has with his people, the quarrel of my covenant. Uh, poetic and uh, language that <coughs> suggests the failure of keeping it. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Um, verse 28, I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Isn't it interesting that in all of the recent calamities of Israel, not one Jewish spokesman, and I have to say also, very few, if any, Christian spokesmen, have made clear to Israel that the suffering is relative to their sins though the testimony of God over this point is prolific I can show it to you again and again and again that 
for your sins am I doing this that this is in proportion to your sins everything is relative to the sins of Israel but seven times more because of the uh, brilliance you know, of their call I will make your cities waste in verse 31 bring your sanctuaries unto desolation I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors I will bring the land into desolation and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it that has had a past fulfillment but it will also have a future fulfillment and I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste and you may have heard me say that before the Lord gave me illumination when I would read about the city's waste, I thought that meant the cities of antiquity. But I know now with absolute conviction it means Haifa, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Tiberias, and every present modern day city of Israel will be made desolate and waste. They are fated to, to experience again the fulfillment of these judgments so long as the cycle of sin and iniquity is not over. Until there's a repentance and a breaking and a turning, the, the consequence will fall again. So the prophet is speaking about a past condition, speaking about a future condition. And some students have missed it, considering the future because they see this only in terms of past fulfillments. Everything that's described here was fulfilled in the Babylonian captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem in 587. It was fulfilled again in 70 AD and it will be fulfilled again, I believe, before this decade shall be over. There's a repetition, you know, there's an unbroken continuum. And uh, let's come now to the promise in verse 39. And they that are left of you, isn't, isn't that a, uh, what's the word for that, a melancholy phrase? They that are left of you. And I, and, I, and I can say assuredly that those that survive God's last days, judgments, and calamities of Israel will be only a remnant. A remnant shall return. Mm -hmm those that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies lands and also in the iniquity of their fathers shall they pine away with them how is it that something that has had an origin two or three millennia before still is part of the present experience of that generation that's the unbroken continuum of sin and its uh, consequence and we see this not only for Israel we see it for mankind we see it in ourselves that the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. My children are suffering from my failures. My sins and my failure is being visited upon them and they're struggling with things that have nothing to do with their own failures. But and some people say, well, how can God judge the innocent? And what about the million and a half children in the Holocaust that surely could not have been even capable of sin? That's what makes judgment judgment when the innocent are necessary victims of the sins of their fathers. And if we knew that, we would do everything to walk in such a way before God as to avoid sin and its consequence, not only for ourselves, but also for our children. If we'll not do it for ourselves, will we do it for them? If we understand that that's what judgment does. So here's God's requirement. You can almost preface the word but at the beginning of verse 40. But... And God is still waiting for this but. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I have also walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, that is to say, it was just and righteous altogether. Now, can you say that after seeing the Fiddler, uh, Schindler's List, that this was the theme of that film? To encourage the viewer to understand that the Holocaust was the consequence of the sins of our fathers and our own sins, and that however painful a calamity it was in our experience, it was altogether just and righteous and in proportion to our sins? Then that film would have been worthwhile. Instead, what does it do? It portrays us as victims, uh, seeking the sympathy of others in such a way as that the calamity will not again be repeated. Because it does not see it coming from the hand of God, but from men. So the word of God is clear. I will, I will, I will bring the sword against you. I will. To attribute the judgments of God 
to be the work of men, though he employs men, or to say that it's an aberration in history, that, that madman Hitler, if only he did not live. If he didn't live, God would have been created ten like him over us in order to affect his judgments. One of the great uh, perplexities of military historians is why Germany, in the last stages of the war, the final extremity, stripped of manpower, stripped of resources, nevertheless never let the oven cease. They kept cremating Jews till the day that the, that the Allied forces walked into Auschwitz and into Dachau and all those places. They were, they were in a fever of extermination, even when it was contrary to their own self-interest. When they should have been depleting their forces for their own protection and defense, they still invested monumental amounts of money and material and manpower in the elimination of European Jewry. And the, and the question was, well, why did the Allies bomb the train tracks, bringing the victims to the ovens? And they never did it. I don't know what reasons they gave. They could not do it because God's judgments are inexorable. And to attribute them to men is to miss the point of the God who works in history. And if we'll not see God in history working his judgment, can we believe for God in history to work his restoration? See what we do? We forfeit not only an understanding of our past and misuse the past to enlist a kind of maudlin sympathy for ourselves as victims that will guarantee that we'll be victims again, but it, it robs us of any real hope for the future. Because the God whose word said we will be judged is the God who says we will be restored. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, and tell them they have suffered double for their sins, but now I'm going to return them. How shall they believe that if they've not believed the first? See how everything hinges on the word of God and our failure to examine the meaning of our calamity in the light of the word has been our tragic condition. Because the rejection of the word is the rejection of God. God is the word. And what how have we suffered for the failure to consider it? If we had all kinds of time and we can do this yourself, Deuteronomy 32 is called the Song of Moses. But it's not a charismatic ditty. <laughs> it's a solemn warning of last day's terror that will come upon Israel for their apostasy. Where it says that uh, you will die in the chambers. You can listen to that word. Mm -hmm. And that the, the uh, how does it say? The suckling with the old man and then the young men and the women together. And when they open the doors of the gate of the <laughs> ovens, that's exactly the composition of the layers. On the bottom were the old men and the infants who had not the strength to climb up to gasp the last air that remained. And on the top were the most virile and the youngest. They died in the exact layers and proportions as the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 describes. And why was it given as a song? That it should be recited to your children that you should learn this as a warning. Well, I never learned it. I don't know one Jew in a hundred thousand that has ever read Deuteronomy 32 and can even find it in the Bible. We are a non-biblical people and the rejection of the Bible is the rejection of God and the rejection of God and of his covenant is the reason for which we have suffered the devastating calamities. The only thing that saves it eternally is purely out of his grace his infinite grace without any deserving in our part our history before him has been a scandal he says you have blasphemed my name in all nations where I have driven you but his infinite grace and goodness will, will restore a remnant at the end and bring them again into the fulfillment of his calling and give them a new name and make them his ministers and so bestow them with the knowledge of himself and the fullness of his spirit that will make Pentecostalism and, and the charismatic movement look like kid stuff. There we will have the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that remnant to fit them for the millennial calling and they will be a glory and a diadem in his hand. The great mercies of God after the great judgments of God. And that not only will you know that I am the Lord, really know, but the heathen round about you, when they see this, will know also. 
So, the whole prophetic task is to restore this biblical mindset to secular Bible rejecting mentalities. What a task. I have not succeeded with my own mother. What a task. And it's not going to be a welcome task. You're coming out of the woodwork and you're crazy and how can you say that and we're nice people and we've never hurt anybody and I've never murdered anyone it's remarkable how uh, alien the concept of sin is to ourselves as a people we celebrate ourselves we think we're hot stuff and look what we've done and the Nobel and Paul surprises and, and things that we've won but if Avi Wiesel himself is any example who indeed is a Pulitzer Prize winner and a celebrated writer and humanist whose, whose own family has been obliterated in Auschwitz who says, I refuse to consider this what a statement of what sin in fact is the elevation of the opinion of a man over and against the word of God is the very anatomy and quintessence of sin itself. Spoken and expressed by the best of Jewry, not the worst. What then is the condition of the worst? <coughs> and if God who judged the nation for that condition before, will he not judge it for that condition now? So I'm, I'm saying what the prophetic task must be, and is not is uh, is it not the ground to which Israel's present understanding must be brought? How is it that Jewish calamity historically is never examined in this context? You'll never find it this way. I made such an ass of myself at a conference on the Holocaust at the University of Washington in Seattle, and they almost had to kick me out. Scholars meeting for their 22nd annual year on the study of the Holocaust and omitting God from their consideration and just reviewing the statistical evidence how many lives were lost by what poison what cyanide was used and never raising the question where was God in all this and here I am trying to to to, uh, to sound that note and I was virtually taken by the scruff of my neck and how Hoist it. I've never been invited back to the conference. In fact, one of the founders of the conference said, Well, Dr. Katz, he, he, he gave me an honorary title. You need to know, he said, that, and he, he's a Christian, that we have to separate evangelism from scholarship. Baloney. I can't think of a place where this note needed more to be struck than men who occupy themselves with the subject of the Holocaust but have never seen it in this life nor communicated it to people who need desperately to hear it or else they suffer the same thing yet again. It's remarkable what has been ushered in over the issue of the Holocaust in present day theology and in the seminaries. In the seminary that I attended, the Lutheran Seminary, they had moved from an evangelical position, namely to bring witness to Israel, and that we have as much to learn from Judaism as Judaism has to learn from Christianity. Mm -hmm. So this whole dialogical alternative to an evangelistic thrust has so weakened the church in its witness as to corrode the very foundations of its whole life. That the man who was teaching this course, who had formerly been involved in the evangelical witness, was now the most caricatured, stunted piece of humanity. Uh, he was, uh, what do you call it, uh, his manhood. Manhood. He was emasculated by deference to the Jewish community because of the sense of guilt that the church bears for the Holocaust. Subscribing to Jewish interpretation of that calamity as not being the consequence of their sin as a nation, but the failure of Christianity, seeing that it issued from a German Protestant nation. And because the church does not have an alternative interpretation of this prophetic kind it has subscribed to the Jewish truth and feels guilty about it and feeling guilty their, their argument is how can we now uh, present the gospel to Jews we, you know, if the ground has been taken from us how, how can we uh, call them to that after what we have done 
Now, having settled that, all that is that to say that they're absolved from all responsibility, that there is a, indeed a, a, a failure and a tragic one, and one for which the church itself will be judged. But I can tell you much more about this, and I don't know if this is the time, but the whole weakness of German Christianity that made it virtually a caricature of the apostolic faith was not in the least bit affected by the influence of Jewish intellectuals in the 18th century who encouraged a movement away from biblical orthodoxy and into a liberal view of the, of the faith that emasculated the faith and created the void into which the demonic phenomena of, of Nazism came. So that what, what came upon us in the Holocaust was the very Frankenstein that we in fact ourselves hope to create. God sees this. And yet we have a hatred against the Germans who are our creation. We were so formative in German culture and civilization and into the, re into the removal of the church of the faith as being a viable factor in German life. Without exception, every ideologue who contributed to the formation of the Nazi ideology was the disillusioned son of a Protestant minister looking for some alternative to antiseptic and predictable Lutheran Protestantism and found it in an occultism that became the Nazi movement and were its ideological leaders. But little wonder that God employed that nation to bring his judgment if we could best see it. How do you like to present that message to the church community? They'll be sending my, my corpse home to my mother to, to bury the, the victim who's been stoned to death. That is a message that needs to be brought. And maybe our people will be more partial to hear it in the midst of their judgment. Somehow when you've been uprooted and cast out and uh, being driven in your uh, things that constituted your, res your respectable, polite, and affluent life are no longer there, you're much op more open to hear the things that pertain to the truth as God sees it. What a remarkable revelation of God as God. To see him in the majesty of his judgments because he's righteous and the magnitude of his mercy because he's holy. We, we lose that revelation of God when we lose this, the great saga of Israel and have a truncated and inadequate God whom we call Jesus, who is our buddy boy, who helps us in a way and gets us what we need and to whom we offer a few chintzy choruses. What a pathetic picture because of the loss of God in this full of way. Hmm. Okay. Covenant stipulations are binding as an autonomous, lawless generation chooses not to know. Covenant is requirement and law, keeping it. And the spirit of our generation is lawlessness. We are antinomian, even as believers, let alone in the world, and let alone as Jews. And we don't want to hear of regulation and requirement. And all of that is a consequence of our indifference to covenant. So the consequences of this as a curse might be deferred. In other words, the judgment doesn't come right on the day that you fail. It might be postponed, but it will inevitably come, however long it's deferred. And it's ironic, as we mentioned yesterday, that when Israel goes out of its way to apprehend Nazi criminals, these guys are now 80, 90 years old. I mean, this is 50 years after the event. They were not kids when it was performed. But if they're still alive and breathing, my God will, will turn the world upside down and inside out to apprehend them and bring them back and try them and execute them. Because as the, as the um, advocate for Israel said over the Eichmann trial, that however long a judgment might be deferred and postponed, inevitably and truly it must one day come. And so Eichmann must perish even a generation after his deeds. But the same logic is true for the nation itself. However long God defers the judgment. And why does he defer? Why is it not instantaneous? 
because he is not willing that any should perish. The same, very same reason why the judgment of God has not fallen on this country and on the nations of the world in their filth, filthy apostasy and conduct and blasphemous denial of God is the mercy that withholds it and defers it, not willing that any should perish. That if there's any hope for any last soul yet hearing a word that by which they can be saved and that they will yet turn and come, God uh, withholds. But the day will come when the last grace has expired and the, and the word of God is no longer heard and the prophets whom he rises up early and sends are rejected, then the judgment comes and when it comes it's devastating. So, we mustn't be deceived to think that because judgment is deferred that it's not going to come or that God has forgotten or that we can go along sailing blindly and establish our own nation and uh, resuscitate our own language and become a high-tech civilization as if all that is the biblical past and uh, you know it, who even knows that it's true. Isn't it remarkable that the one nation that has the, the greatest likelihood of understanding the biblical past because the Bible is part of its curriculum is the nation that most rejects it as being credible and the testimony of God. The Bible is our book, as if we created it. And it's interesting stories in the prophets that has no application to the present. The God of the Bible is not a living God, one who need not be considered and sought, even in the light of our worst predicaments. But they can talk to uh, Aliphat, but will not talk to God. And if that does not invite the judgment of God, I don't know what will. <coughs> in fact, God calls, talk about covenant, he calls agreement with Arafat and Antichrist figures like that a covenant with death and with hell. And that will be Israel's final shame that instead of deferring and turning to a God who could have been its salvation, it will turn to men who are even their enemies and who are dedicated to their eradication, thinking that that could be their safety. What a pathetic commentary on what is the condition of the nation at its best. These are its best leaders who are all humanists and whose confidence and faith is in man even after the Holocaust. The, the terror and the magnitude of these earthly judgments like a Holocaust going up in the fire do not make the full sense of God's intention except that they be seen in the light of eternity. Vasilea Schlink, that precious German oracle, isn't it here again, from Germany comes the greatest depth of insight, calls those judgments preliminary judgments to save mankind from final and utter and ultimate judgment. So that if we would recognize in the fires of the Holocaust a greater fire that cannot be quenched, for which this fire would be intended to bring us to a place of repentance, that we would search our collective soul and say, for what sins have we suffered this calamity? Then we would have been saved from the fire that is eternal and from which there is no remedy except the repentance now. I brought a message like that, some of you may have heard on faith, in, in Japan, a minister of conference, uh, a conference to ministers, and I said, if you think that the atom bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was just a political ex and military expedient, mm -hmm. you've got another thing to come in. This was not the conduct of men. This was the judgment of God for a God-rejecting nation who has slain the missionaries that have come to it and to this day does not have in the Japanese language a word for sin. That Shintoism, like Judaism, is a contrived human religious system that is man-serving and God-rejecting. And that the atom bombing of your cities engulfed in fire was a preliminary judgment to save the nation from the fires to come that would be unextinguishable. And a man shot out of a seat as he was launched from a cannon of ministry cried out, God, he said, it make me a prophet to my nation. And that indeed is the word that Japan needs to hear and the nations of the world and this nation. In fact, with, uh, what, what is the collective uh, statement that has come out of the Holocaust? Not some repentant acknowledgement for a sin uh, of the fathers and our own of a magnitude in keeping with the calamity, but never again. A human resolution 
that we need not face such calamities again because they have come humanly rather than divinely and that somehow we will have the strength not of terror not to confess that such condition need not come when the people come out with a resolution like that it's an, an invitation to God for yet another judgment because they have not taken the part though they were burned round about by the fires. The ironies are so profound now that beyond any dispute they cannot have been accidental. There's a God of history and his judgments are ironic and what he employs that his hand to anyone who has any discernment is so visible. Whatsoever man sows, however long before, that he shall be reaped, even if it's millennia later, you feel still reap it. And how you read history and how you regard is how you understand causation. Mm -hmm. Cause and effect. Merely because something is delayed does not mean it's unconnected. And it's imperative for us to see the connections, because in seeing the connections we see God. So where are the prophets now who would communicate this understanding? and not condescend to Israel's view of herself as being victim and give her a false comfort as false prophets and make nice when they need a word of comfort where God says, tell Israel their transgressions and Jacob their sins. Having lost all sense of this causal connection, we do not see the linkage between Israel's present apostasy and her historic suffering. And this is expressed today in Judaism's efforts to assure that future calamity will be avoided through education. I don't know how many appeals I get. I belong to the uh, the Brith, I belong to uh, the Anti-Defamation League, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the Jewish Holocaust uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. Now I'm getting how many letters, I'm getting phone calls, wanting friends, and, what, and I say, well, what's it for? For education. The whole reason for which the multi-million dollar Holocaust Museum was established in Washington, D.C. is to educate. Talk about a humanistic premise that if mankind is educated, evil will not take place. God is absolutely absent as a factor for their consideration. And I said to the girl on the phone, I said, but you be a thing, I said, don't you understand that our worst sufferings have come from the most educated people on the face of the earth? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and if education did not succeed in the land of Goethe, Schiller, Richter, Hegel, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, is it going to succeed with dum-dums? Mm -hmm. You think money is going to save you by programs? Mm -hmm. Turn to your God. Poor little thing. You're <laughs> 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 trying to do service you know, for Judaism. <coughs> and I have to say, unhappily, that we Jews have been the foremost class of being the ideologues and the... Uh, the the uh, pro proclaimers of that. We, we are inveterate humanists. You know, our confidence is in men and in ourselves. So not being able to see the past interventions of God as his judgment nullifies all hope and believing for the future. You've got to see this. If you will not see the judgments of God in the past in fulfillment of his word, you will not have any confidence or any hope in the future on the basis of the promise of this world. Therefore, if Israel is to have any hope that will save it in the trials that are ahead, it will be only on the basis of God's word, believed when in, uh, in the fulfillment of the judgments that have taken place. The same God who has fulfilled the word of judgment will fulfill the word of restoration and return. And there's no other basis for their hope but the word of God and what people have more right to believe the word of God which they have known in their experience if only they will see it not as the aberration of a Hitler or the failure of western nations to take them in or to bomb the railroad tracks that led to the extermination camps but to see it as the fulfillment of God's word I will I will bring the sword I will bring the fire I will so to what to see God in past intervention in judgment is to believe him for future intervention in mercy. That God intervenes at all in the affairs of men is ultimate offense to the humanistic and liberal mind. There's something about God intervening that is horrific to unbelieving men. 
They want man to do it. If the desert is to bloom as a rose, it'll be through an irrigation project or a dam that's built. It's not going to be through the miraculous power of God. That's an offense. And I'll, if you haven't heard this experience of mine, very early in my believing life when I was in New York City being trained uh, in the Jewish mission work, and the Jews for Jesus phenomenon was just beginning. We got a phone call from a high school. Please send us one of your spokesmen to uh, visit one of our senior classes. So they sent me. And their teacher was an Orthodox Jew. Had a yarmulke on, Van Dyke beard, beautiful, ethical, moral, fastidious man. And I presented something about the faith and the Lord. And we got into a, uh, a dialogue that became a very heated debate. And we were going out of hammer and tongues before the students. And the bell rang, the class was over. And we went out into the hallway and we continued. And as I'm talking to him, all of a sudden I realize, as orthodox as this man is, as fastidious as he is in all of these ceremonial observances, he does not really believe in God supernaturally. And I said, excuse me, I said, just a moment. Do you believe that God parted the Red Sea and allowed Israel to go over as on dry ground? It's as if I'd taken a bucket of water and sloshed him. The guy went speechless and he choked and he spluttered and that. But he said, well, he said it was the confluence of parts. He, he was orthodox in his orthopraxy, but he was not orthodox in his orthodoxy. Can you see the difference? Yes, it was the confluence of parts. He said, well, what about the birth of uh, Isaac to a, a, a father who was uh, a hundred, 99 years old and a mother who had been lifelong barren? Oh, that was, and he gave me another naturalistic explanation. And I saw, even in an orthodox man, the inability or the unwillingness to believe in God as God, as the God who is supernatural, as the God who can intervene in history, as God, as God. And um, I've never forgotten that. So, that God intervenes at all in the affairs of men is ultimate offense to the liberal mind. We want to do it ourselves. Then, even now, in obtaining its own salvation through its own efforts. I don't know when I wrote this, but it was long before the concordance with Arafat and the PLO. So I would say my prophetic statement has come to pass that because men despise God's interventions, they will seek to obtain their own through their own efforts. And what that effort is, and what real hope it offers, is a mock, and Israel will suffer the failure of it. So, as modern post-enlightenment Jews, we are equally as adverse to the concept of sin as we are to leaving for divine intervention. There's a conjunction between our inability to understand sin and our inability to understand that God who can intervene. And the events of the last days are calculated because we have rejected the word to demonstrate the truth out of our own experience of judgment and return. Okay, I praise God that all of this is on tape because not just the intellectual uh, weight of these concepts but the moral weight and I don't know that I've ever read another class but my voice has broken mm -hmm. so many times as, as today so we just need to pray that um, that it will not be lost to us that this is not my sentiment uh, uh, being expressed but the grief of God you know, in all of his, the, our afflictions he's afflicted he knows what's coming Jesus wept when he looked at Jerusalem oh how oft would I have taken you under my wings as a hen does a chicks but you would not you have missed the day of your visitation. He knew the tragedy that would come upon Jerusalem. Not one stone would be left standing on another in the temple that they so much celebrated. They would be expelled from the nation. They would be a ghetto people. They would be a, a, a thorn in the side of the world and all nations where they would be dispersed. There would be judgments and calamities and holocaust and again a final devastation. All set in motion by that single grievous rejection of him whom the Father has sent. So tragic is the consequence of sin. As a, are you saying we suffered all this because you rejected Jesus? No, you suffered all this because the rejection of Jesus was the capstone and the final culmination of a long-standing rejection of your prophets and of your word and of yourself. He sent the prophets and you stoned them. He sent his son and you crucified him. 
There was no alternative after that. That was the final filling up of the cup of iniquity and sin. And the judgment that had followed all stemmed from that. So what a, what a task before us to communicate that to a yet unbelieving nation who have not even in this hour with sitting on a powder keg ready to go off any real sense of the, the, the grief and the devastation that is before them. It's humanly unthinkable. This can't come upon us. That's what our Jewish forebear said in Germany in the early 1930s and we're saying now what it is. So Lord, we, what shall we say? Precious God. We ask your apology. We identify, Lord, with the nation. Our own neck has been stiff and our own ears have been closed, my God. We are all God rejectors to the one degree or another. And we thank you for a mercy that does not obliterate us. And we cleave to your promise. Though you will destroy the nations that you have dis- that have destroyed us, yet you will not destroy us in full, but you'll allow a remnant for your name. <coughs> Lord, sink something deep into our consciousness and into our spirits, precious God. The enormous calamity that comes from unrepentant sin, that however long deferred, will in its time be given. And grant us, my God, that however much previous generations of prophets have been rejected and scorned and derided and expelled and stoned, that you will give us a power and an authority to bring, my God, your perspective to a people, even a remnant of them, which if they will receive it will save them from the calamity to come. Grant us that ability, Lord, we pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this historic time. We're not ashamed to call it that. This is more than a class. This is more than a school. Life and death hang in the balance, my God. And for this, we have to say, who is sufficient? We're frail beings, my God. Shot through with defect. But for their sake and for your sake and your great name's sake, so form us and so shape us and so use us, my God, that there might be an eternal rejoicing despite the, the horrors that are yet to come. We bless you and ask you to seal this for us and speak to us through the day and in the night hours and uh, establish your truth in our hearts and our character by your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.